O Lord of hosts, be with us, for we have none other help in times of adversity but Thee. O Lord of hosts, have mercy on us. Wow. Um, it looked like a couple people, I don't know if you have anything more to say about Sola Fide. As a few of the Orthodox guys said, ask Jay again about Sola Fide. He was speaking mostly about Sola Scriptura. Um, I don't know, is, it, is there anything you'd like to go back? Or no, we, should, we should mention that. So um, the easiest way that I would go about responding to Sola Fide is to point out the logic of the progression of Genesis 12, 15, 17, 22. So if you look at Romans 4, this is usually the passage that a, that a, that a Protestant will go to to say, look, uh, Paul's going to cite Genesis. He's going to cite the fact that, that Abraham is the principal example of how we're saved by faith and not by any works. And if you look, it says uh, uh, Abraham was the friend of God and he was justified by righteousness apart from works. The problem is that when Paul cites that text, what text does he cite? He cites Genesis 15. He doesn't cite Genesis 12. But if Paul's doctrine is the reformation doctrine of sola fide and remember what sola fide says is that there's a transition from wrath to grace right mm -hmm. so when you exercise saving faith for the first time in the reformed view it's the regenerating power of the holy spirit that comes to you if you're one of the elect the spirit is going to regenerate you in an inner spiritual way so that you can believe and can repent that has to happen first before you can repent then the transition from wrath to grace is that first period when you first have saving faith in Christ. That's the regenerative work of the Holy Spirit. You can never be un unregenerate. If that happens to you, you were truly and effectually called and you, you were regenerate, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the Reformation view. I'm just laying that out. That's the, the that's the right. typical reform view. Most everybody I know that's reform would say that. And so they'll go to Romans 4 and they'll say, this was this is what Paul's talking about, right? Paul's saying Abraham was saved. But the problem is that he's not saying he should have cited Genesis 12. He cites Genesis 15. But Paul, but Abraham is called and exercises faith in Genesis 12. So this shows us Paul's doctrine, unless you think Paul messed up, if you're reformed, right? Paul should have cited Genesis 12, but he doesn't. And so what we have here is a distinction between um, the word of God being nominal or effectual and so the reformation idea is that you can have a status of justification that's purely legal that's not based on the inner transformation even though there is an inner transformation yes you are regenerated but you're still filthy rags you see you're still wicked even though you've been regenerated which is odd but you've been regenerated and transformed on the inner man by the power of the holy spirit you're still completely wicked and filthy in your work. So I'll always cite Isaiah. We're all filthy rags, right? We're menstrual rags. So, but, you, but, but God's word is somehow at the same time. So this makes God a liar. Basically God can call a man who's filthy, wicked and unrighteous, righteous because he's not in, in actual fact, righteous. He's righteous on the basis of a legal category that covers him, which is the penal substitution debt model where Christ's created merited righteousness is imputed to your theoretical spiritual bank account. Now we can easily destroy that right away. How do we easily destroy this? Again, if you had the right Christology, you would know that this is Nestorianism. Christ is not a human person who fulfills a covenant of works, right? That merits this created status of, of legal fiction that's attributed to you. Now, in, Re in Reformed theology, be careful, be clear what I'm arguing here. In Reformed theology, this has to be a created righteousness. It has to be a created status, right? Because it's new. It comes into effect when Christ merits this, right? Mm -hmm. Who is Jesus? Jesus of Nazareth is this perfect Jew who fulfills the law of God. He fulfills the covenant of works that Adam broke in the garden. That merited status that he merits over his lifetime obviously is created because it relates to all of his uh, temporal actions of keeping the Mosaic law, right? So he fulfills perfect righteousness by meriting the status, fulfilling the covenant works. They're obviously created works. Then that gives this sort of bank account 
that God can put into your account. He can see you as righteous, even though you're actually filthy rags underneath this righteousness. <laughs> By the way, no wonder Protestantism gives rise to all this hypocrisy. Right. Right. Because it doesn't actually require the inner trend. Now they'll say, well, but if you're really saved, you will transform. There'll be an inner trend. But that begs the question, right? Right. Because we're still attributing to God the power to lie, to say that people are righteous who are, in fact, not actually righteous. Only Christ was righteous. There was one righteous man in history, and that was Jesus of Nazareth, right? But now, wait a minute. What did we just read from Cyril? What did we just read from the councils? They talk about a Christ who is a single divine person who becomes incarnate, deifies the human nature that he assumed. So there's not a human person in Jesus. That's Nestorianism. There's no Jesus of Nazareth who's a separate human subject, any created hypostatic reality that is that is doing these works. It's the son of God who became incarnate, the second person right. of the Godhead, a divine person. Right. So he doesn't do any works to merit his status or his righteousness. The uncreated power that he possesses because he's fully divine with the father has the full divine nature of the father. He has all those powers. That's what he deifies his human nature with. So he's not meriting a status of keeping the Mosaic law to give a bank account that you can draw from. Right. So the easiest way to refute this even quicker is to point out that penal substitutionary theory, classically speaking, now some modern people in the Reformed and Protestant tradition have actually been made aware of the problems of this view, so they'll try to skirt around it. But all of the classical reformers, and we can go through this, uh, if you look at this uh, link from my uh, old Catholic friend of mine, Nick, I, I, I helped him kind of draw up this uh, essay there, where he goes through the, the Reformed tradition uh, and also Luther as well, uh, he wrote an essay called Was Jesus Damned in Your Place? And it's basically just a, a bunch of a collection of quotes from Luther, from John Piper, John MacArthur, uh, 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 Charles Hodge, uh, maybe John Murray. I'm trying to remember who all's in there. Calvin, um, J.I. Packer, uh, R.C. Sproul. Let's see who else is in here. More from Piper, C.J. Mahaney. Um, there's quite a few. And then he's got a whole separate essay from just from John Piper of, uh, about Jesus being damned in our place. And this is what the reformers do to actually vindicate and back up this weird doctrine is, uh, Luther, for example, reinterprets Christ's descent into Hades. He says, yes, Christ descended into Hades. That means the father damned him. Now, wait a minute. The father damned the son. I mean, this splits the Trinity. Right. If you believe the Son is a divine person, like Cyril taught, then how can you? How can one hypostasis of the Trinity damn the other? It's impossible. It's ludicrous. It would divide the Trinity. One of the so the will they all share the same will. The Father wills contrary to the Son. Now this is what happens to the Holy Spirit in this equation. Right. What about the perichoresis? Don't the persons indwell one another? Mm -hmm. How can one person be damned when they indwell one another? It's ludicrous. It's stupid. And it's blasphemous, by the way. The only other option is if you're reformed and you want to maintain this penal substitution debt payment system is to opt for Jesus being a human person to be full on this. And some reformed people do this. Some reformed people are like, okay, fine, I'm an historian. I'll be an historian. They say, yeah, Jesus was a human guy uh, who merited all this and he was damned and he took the payment as a human person. So they're fine with adopting full Nestorianism. And if that was the case, I would just say, go read Cyril against Nestorius, right? Because you're going to see that Nestorianism is on its face absurd and basically just falls into Arianism, right? It's just another version of Arianism because it's not the son of God who became incarnate to heal and save us in our corrupt nature and to overcome death. It's a human guy who's morally united now to God, who is our example, right? Mm -hmm. It's no longer a miraculous salvation it's the moral example theory of the atonement is what Arianism and Nestorianism lead directly to. It removes the supernatural deification, immortality, divine life component, and it makes it this thing that now you do to match the example of Jesus. Now, I know that Reformed people don't confess that. What I'm saying is, if you go the route of Nestorianism, 
in this dilemma that I've put you in, mm -hmm. then you're going to have to opt for that. You're going to have to opt for the rest of Nestorius's presuppositions and system. Right. Otherwise, you're going to have to say that one person in the Trinity damned another person in the Trinity, which is blasphemous, ludicrous, contrary to everybody's Trinitarian theology in the first thousand years, or even anything, even in Rome after, right? Nobody held this until the reformers. It's a, it's a, it's an absurd, blasphemous doctrine, and it's only there to prop up the presuppositions of sola fide. So, if penal substitution in that sense, in that sense, falls apart, then sola fide, its complement is not true. 